Today we've got an awesome story of revenge all about helping some people save some money. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, crazy neighbor. A few years ago, I resigned from my job and was moving interstate and preparing to pursue further education. Unfortunately, I had difficulty selling my condo and was gradually exhausting all my savings and emergency extra funds over the time it took to sell. After a while, it got to the point where I had to liquidate many of the things I own to not only stay afloat, but also prepare for my move. I consequently fell behind on my $80 per month condo fees, but figured once it was sold, the notary would make the necessary adjustments anyhow and all would be finalized, paid, and okay. I wasn't in a position to pay those fees at the time, and I hadn't received any notification about it. I felt I was very close to selling. I wasn't receiving any other income, however. Eventually, I sold my piano to get some money, and a moving truck came over to pick it up and deliver it to the new buyers. My neighbor downstairs thought I was skipping town when he saw the piano movers taking my piano and saw it as an opportunity to confront me. I left my front door partially open during the piano move, and the neighbor downstairs came right into my place screaming at me about skipping town and not paying the condo fees. I was surprised he knew. He was a retired, stocky man and was fuming at me right inside my living room. Well, inside my condo. I asked him to leave and he refused to leave. Fearing I would lose control with a senior, I called the police, left the condo with him inside and waited outside to cool off. The police arrived and I informed them what he did and where he was and left to a meeting that morning. I knew the police had warned him about trespassing and I knew he'd never be back again. So I spent the next week or so exacting my petty revenge over the intrusion into my home. First of all, I gleefully spent hours signing him up to receive all sorts of junk mail and phone calls from coffin catalogs to women's makeup, sample adult diapers, anti-diarrhea samples, Avon products, timeshare, you name it. I unleashed all my creative juices and went to it. If I could find it online and if it was free, I would have them send it or contact him. He would have been contacted by phone, by mail, and by email from many, many different places over the next few weeks at least. Secondly, I turned into an elephant in my condo. I would lift up the furniture, during daylight of course, and drop it heavily on the ground several times so we'd hear it. He couldn't come up, so we had to bear it. Long story short, I let it all out over that time and sold my place paid the outstanding condo fees in full, and left. I'm just wondering, if this guy is a downstairs neighbor, how did they know anything about OP's situation with the condo fees? Like, did the owner show up one day pounding on OP's door saying, pay your unpaid condo fees? Like, how does he get access to that information? Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of revenge, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below? That said, our next story is... Hold up the line because you're a rude, indecisive gambler? Okay, sir. This happened about an hour ago. A little backstory. Today marks about a week since I left my last job, and I have plenty of time to kill before I start my new job. I'm taking this time as a vacation. After all, I've worked hard and all my bills are paid up for three months. So today I went to go get a coffee, cigarettes, and gas from down the road. I get to the gas station and there's this middle-aged gentleman buying some lottery. He's taking his time buying scratch tickets and draw games. And I mean really taking his time. No problem I think. I have nowhere to go and nothing to do. I have the time. The first three minutes go by and he's got several different draw games that he's fumbling into his little plastic lottery pouch. Okay I think. My turn. Nope. The guy starts scratching these scratch tickets he bought at the counter. The cashier doesn't look happy and tells the guy not to scratch them at the counter and the indecisive lottery guy waves him off, saying something about, it'll just be a minute. The cashier tells him there's a line. The gambler looks back at me, the only person in line, and says, you'll be fine. This is about five minutes in line now. I think to myself that this guy is rude and I could leave and go to another gas station and get home faster, but it's fine, I have the time, I'll be fine. The guy finishes scratching his tickets and starts looking them over. I don't think he got any winning tickets. He starts making small talk to the cashier about a big one or something, while digging into his pocket for his wallet. He pulls out a $20 bill and asks the cashier for the current numbers on the $20 lottery books 
clearly thinking the ticket number meant something. Rude and superstitious, I think. Lottery guy goes back and forth between two ticket books. Give me the ticket with number 143. No, wait, the one with 78. No, wait, 143. No, 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 wait, wait, give me 78. 78's the one. He pays and begins scratching the ticket at the counter again. It's been about eight minutes in line now. The cashier is dead inside. I'm a bit fed up. The gambler is just inconsiderate. The gambler finishes scratching, sees that he lost, mumbles something about the next one, and walks over to the ATM. My turn. Cue petty revenge. I walk up to the counter and say loudly, Can I get cigarettes, gas on pump 3, and that $20 ticket number 143, please? The lottery guy hears this and shoots me an absolute side eye. It doesn't help my case that the ATM is not in direct eye line of the counter, and I had turned my body to watch him side eye me. I was being petty. I had to witness the damage. So I pay the bill, turn around and walk three feet to the lottery checker and scratch, then scan the redemption code, and boop! Winning ticket, please see retailer, flashes on the screen. I turn around, walk three feet back to the cashier as the lottery guy finishes at the ATM, so I'm now first in line with the lottery guy behind me. The cashier scans the redemption code and the machine does its trumpet chime as the screen flashes, $100 winning ticket! I tell the cashier I'll take the cash. The lottery guy is all pissy at the whole thing, and as I walked toward the door, I got the best revenge of my life. The lottery guy said, hey bud, that was my freaking ticket. I was just at the ATM. I was just coming back to buy that, bud. I said, well, I bought it, so it means you didn't buy it, which means that it's mine since I bought it. They said, that's not right, bud. That was my ticket. That's not the correct thing to do, dude. I got a wife and a baby on the way. I can give you $20 for the money you spent on my ticket, but I need that $100. That was my freaking ticket, dude. I said, oh, I didn't know. So you got a pregnant wife and you need this $100? They said, yes. Me half out the door. You'll be fine. And I go out to pump gas, then leave. I'm a little surprised the guy didn't chase after me or try to fight me. Funny thing is, I don't normally play the scratch lottery tickets anymore, so if he were polite in line, I wouldn't have purchased winning ticket number 143. So you're telling me that this guy's out here like, I've got a pregnant wife and child, they need that money. Oh, by the way, cashier, can you give me this ticket and that ticket? I know I've collectively spent at least $100 here today alone, but I might, you know, win another $100 for my wife and kid. Our next story is, don't want to act professional? Okay, I'll publish the details in your own professional resources. A colleague of mine had been trying to get the union chapter at his office to get their act together on keeping up certifications, staying active with helping employees, and modernizing their website. They weren't having any of it. Instead, their office went unmanned since COVID, phone calls were not returned, and he couldn't get a hold of someone to answer basic questions. Eventually, a union rep replied to him, accusing him of having an ulterior motive for asking questions. The result? He scoured the many union chapters hoping to find someone competent. And in the course of it, he found that the Union HQ chapter let their web domain lapse, meaning that someone could buy the domain. Being an idealist, I know, I know, it would have been so funny if he bought the website and did something crazy with it. He tried multiple times to get them to shape up. When they didn't, he published an article on a very well-read federal employee site, the kind the union references for data to their members, about just how bad the union can be at their job. He didn't name names, but he did name instances with proof. Think this is the end? Nope. After the article went live, he reached out to every union rep he could locate through their website and emailed them the link to a very good article on union rights and other employee resources. Among the results was that some of the reps forwarded it to all their union members without reading it, essentially endorsing the article that said they were unscrupulous and lazy because they could not be bothered. This week, union leaders were called together on important business. Was it to fix the issues listed in the article? Not from what I've seen. I think more than anything, this just shows that like the unions that work only work when there's enough participating members of that union helping shape it. 
if there is a union that is allowed to just kind of be run by a few people who kind of oversee it all, not only does it personally seem more capable of coming up short, it also seems a lot more capable of being corrupted. Our next story is, use your report button for threats of violence and discrimination, folks. It indeed works. So I had a conversation with just the loveliest radicalized know-it-all the other day. I was disappointed in their behavior, but didn't go attacking them personally for some really misandrous views. She, as I found out later, must have had some extra crappy experiences because she went full mask off with hatred and capstones it by telling me to die in a fire. Yeah, I could have walked away feeling sad for her, but I can still do that and give her some time away from forums to unplug and touch some grass. So I used the good old report button and boom, no more bigotry. I know some moderators won't act on reports, but things that break site-wide rules go straight to administrators and they will outright delete your account for breaking those rules. Telling someone to do that to themselves is breaking that rule, discrimination aside. To anyone reading, this isn't saying that certain groups are beyond criticism, but be respectful and focus on the argument, not the person. If you can't do that, you shouldn't be online or interacting with others. This is one of those situations where if I get into an argument and somebody turns to saying, die in a fire, I can walk away with a smile on my face because one, it's dumb and online so you can just walk away. Two, you know you've beaten them because there's no substance there, they're not arguing any point. If you're discussing a topic and somebody goes off road and tries to just insult you and make fun of you, you try to argue some point and they go, oh well you're just some loser anyways, nobody cares about you, your parents, blah blah blah, your family, blah blah blah, you don't have a partner, blah blah blah. They know they've lost, they're just trying to hurt you. Our next story is sharing music with the neighbors. A while back, I lived in a fairly decent apartment complex and ended up with crappy neighbors. Party until 4am sometimes, fights in the parking lot, all that stuff. My roommate and I got tired of asking nice and reporting it to property managers. Now seriously, I don't mind a little noise sometimes and get together every once in a while. This was several times a week and more than just loud like people fighting and shouting. Music so loud my walls thumped. Anyway, got to the point that I would put my guitar amp against the wall at 8am every morning after and play them very random guitar solos that sounded like Jimi Hendrix but if he forgot how to play right. After a week or two of this, it became clear more action was needed. One day, roommate and I decided to take a trip to the old Applebee's. Of course, we needed to make sure the neighbor knew we hadn't forgotten them, so I rigged up the amp, placed it against the wall, snapped together an adapter for my laptop and plugged it in, loaded up some Daft Punk and set it to repeat. About three hours later, we returned to the neighbors on our doorstep yelling, cussing and threatening. We agreed to turn off the music after only minor altercation, then we decided after dinner, dessert is in order. So we loaded up What Is Love by the much celebrated artist Hathaway. Unfortunately, the particular ice cream shop we desired is 45 minutes away in another county, and I am highly susceptible to brain freeze, so I absolutely had to take it slow with the frosty treats. Another three hours had passed by the time we returned. Again, we were met with yelling, insulting, and threatening. That's okay, because as much as these two thought they were hard, they were not aware of where I grew up. I don't mind the insults and the thinly veiled death threats they intended with the finger gun motions. I'm a pretty big guy, and the roommate was basically a bodybuilder at that time. I know that doesn't matter all the time, but the odds are still in our favor in physical altercation. I assume this is why it never got past threats, as they had no problem fighting amongst themselves at 2am. A night or so later, the party started again. This time it spilled out into the parking lot early. I sat in my bedroom window recording a while for evidence, but then I noticed one of them start to punch and kick cars belonging to other tenants. Fed up, I just called the cops. Not the move I usually make, but figured it was time. Cops arrive, pretty much everyone goes to jail. Turns out most people at the gathering were under drinking age and at least one of them had a warrant of some kind. We didn't see him go again and within a week or two, their belongings were removed. I mean, to be honest, if stuff like this goes on too long and it's too loud, I guess some people would probably hate being a Karen or feeling like it and calling the cops, but it's kind of the right thing to do, although I have seen a lot of people say that the cops didn't help. 
Our next story is laughing at my wife. Okay. This is a recent event, not too serious. Me and my wife traveled back from vacation. We're frequent flyers and we know our way around planes, and we respect that people in front of us can and probably will recline their seats. It's really no problem. So we're flying with Qatar Airlines, and in front of my wife is some girl who is constantly reclining her seat, getting up, putting seat up. Basically in 10 minutes she did all that is possible with her seat. Her husband and I are sitting across the aisle in C seats. Our wives are in D. My wife is pissed, but she's not acting out. She's just frustrated because she's watching a movie and needs to adjust the screen every two minutes. In one moment, I notice that the girl in front of her is smiling and communicating with her husband and pointing at my wife, like she's doing it intentionally. They don't know she's my wife and I'm watching my movie and acting cool. So, time for revenge. Airplane landed, time for leaving, and I'm seeing husband preparing to stand up. I noticed where their bags are when we boarded, so I stood up first and blocked guy from grabbing his bags. I'm a pretty big guy and this dude is one head smaller than me, so I'm standing there acting cool, not giving him any space to pass me and grab bags. Other people are grabbing their luggage, people are ready to leave the plane and there's two of them and their cousins of friends, they took six seats, sitting in their seats and waiting. Guy is really pissed off, but he's silent. And when there was time to leave the plane, I let my wife first. Got after her, but firstly I was assured that line continues after me. They left the plane last, and that dude was furious. Definitely just a small thing to get back at some people who were obviously very inconsiderate. It kinda sucks, but honestly, I would feel guilty reclining my seat on a plane. Our next story is Hidden Laser Crouching Neighbors. I used to live in an apartment complex where there were rows of six two-story high townhouse apartments to each building that were facing each other. The driveway and parking area and spaces were in the middle of them, which created a sound-catching amphitheater valley, which amplified all the parking lot sounds. Everyone's parking spaces were in front of their doors. There were idiots galore who played their car music loud or had social hour in front of their houses and all the kids played there too. I didn't mind that too much except for when it was late at night when everyone was sleeping. Many bedroom windows faced the center of that amphitheater parking lot, mine included. One night across from me, but not directly across, some drunk couples were loud and sitting out there on their front porch. Someone had drove up and started arguing with the people who were sitting there, having social drunk time at 2am disturbing everyone. A fight almost broke out. The car that came in did not belong to anyone who lived there, and after the car zoomed off, the parties were louder than ever, continuing their loud conversations. After about a half hour more of this offending ruckus, I quietly eased my window open, got my laser pointer and shone it onto one of the loud rude neighbors. One of the other people noticed the light on him and told him. They freaked out and all started crouching, ducking and covering behind the cars scrambling to avoid the red dot being put on them. They thought the people who they had just argued with had come back and had them put in the laser sight of a gun. They all ran into the apartment and off the front porch and shut their door, which had been open and playing music for only their pleasure. So rude they were. Soon after, some police cars showed up with whom must have called because they felt their lives were in danger by some unknown lurker with them in their gun's laser sight. I still laugh to this day when I think of them suddenly dropping and crouching and scrambling, running for cover and getting the heck in their apartment where they should have been all along. Sounds to me like somebody hired the two best hitmen west of the Mississippi. Everybody down on the floor like, oh my god. It is funny, but also like if you think about their perspective where they actually think there is a legitimate red dot pointed at them, they were probably terrified. Our next story is charge them the same family rate they charged me. My child's daycare had a death in the family. It's a small family owned place, so this affected all the employees. They sent out an email at like 3 a.m. I couldn't miss work as I had a very important day, so I scrambled to find a sitter just for that day. My stepbrother's girlfriend was basically the only person I know that doesn't work, so I called her. She says, sure, but I can only watch him for six hours, and I'll give you my family rate, so it'll only be $200. I asked if she was serious. She assured me she was, and that this was her livelihood, and she takes it very seriously, that she was already offering me a family discount. Please note that it was not her livelihood. 
My stepbrother has a great job and has always paid for everything. He's tried to get her to do anything to earn money, but she refuses to work and believes he should support her fully, including daily Starbucks, hair, nails, designer stuff, etc. Please also note that I had done a lot for this girl just to help her out. The list is long. I agreed only because I would have lost my job had I not gone to work that day. I paid her $200, which she demanded up front, to get to work for a little over 4 hours after factoring commute. Fast forward a couple of years, they've separated, they have a kid and she's living for free in his dad's extra house, and driving my dad's extra car for free. The ex pays all the bills and necessities. She finally breaks down and gets a job because he stopped paying for her hair, nails, etc. She has a day when her childcare falls through and sends out the same request I did. Can anyone watch my kid? I have to go to work or I'll get fired. I told her I could absolutely do it, then charged her the same bogus price she charged me. I told her it was the family rate. She cussed me out. You gotta love that you can turn this back around on her and she has to realize and recognize that it was ridiculous. The only thing that sucks about it is she didn't pay you. Our next story is an eye for an eye, literally. So I, 24 year old male, live in a mega city in India. I've noticed that through the past 7 years, the traffic situation in the city is worsening by the day, with new vehicles being added to the flow all the time and migrants from different parts of the country moving into the city. Which is fine of course, the only problem is, people in my city do not understand the basic rules of headlights on their vehicles. Now, I'm a night owl who is generally awake and outside till like 2am at least every day. The problem here is, post 7pm, you can notice how at least 50% of fellow commuters have kept their headlights on high beam mode, commonly known as upper in my city. Now, this city has very narrow streets, and in some parts there are no street lights to steer clear on the road. When I'm driving on such narrow streets and the vehicle crossing mine in the opposite direction, if they have their headlights on high beam, I can't see the road clear and it's very easy to miss any potholes, speed breakers, stray animals, or even a passerby. It's a safety hazard and I'm much more prone to accidents when this happens. I've tried to spread awareness about this through various networks, but it seems that ignorance and negligence gets the better of my city people. So I decided to treat it with tit for tat technique. I got my two wheeler installed with the highest allowed capacity headlamps, which has the capacity somewhat similar to newer LED headlight cars. Of course, I usually drive with headlights on in low beam mode, tested by us friends that it's not really blinding when on low beam mode. But whenever I see somebody in the opposite lane driving with high beam, I put on my high beam as well. It's really petty of me to think, okay witch, both of us will suffer the same pain now. But I just can't help it. I mean depending on where you live in the US, you might encounter a lot of very similar behavior. I mean these people just don't care. It makes it easier for them when they're driving at night and there's just no consideration for another driver. This next story is confronted in a parking lot because I legally used a handicap spot. He wound up with a DUI, pretty certain. I'm a healthy looking 55 year old male but have a degenerative nerve disorder and ataxia, balance issues, so I have a very hard time walking. I pull into a handicap spot at the grocery store, put my placard up and get myself out of the car. A very angry person about my age runs up to me screaming about how I'm stealing a handicapped spot from someone who needs it. As he went on, I pulled out my walker and started walking to the store as he continued making a scene. As I walked to the store, a cop who just happened to be there asked what happened. I just told him some people don't get it and pointed to my walker and went about my business. About 30 minutes later I came out of the store and noticed the guy was getting a field sobriety test. I sat in my car and watched as he eventually got arrested. Maybe next time he'll keep his mouth shut. Yeah, I think this guy has a lot more problems going on than anybody parking in any handicapped spot. Hopefully now that they've caught a charge they'll have a little more time to think about it. Our next story is helped my coworkers get around a sneaky store pay trick. I worked in a big department store where it was well known that you were fired at 5 months and 3 weeks, health insurance kicked in at 6 months, they also had sales quotas you had to reach. 
If you reached it one quarter, and then the next quarter you had to sell as much or better, make it 10% raise. Miss it, 10% pay cut. But since in the summer people buy for back to school and right before Christmas there's a month of big sales, each quarter is set up so that you get a lot of sales one quarter, then fewer sales the next quarter, then a lot of sales, then fewer sales, so you start at $10. Summer back to school sales, you have $11, but then fall sales, you go down to $9.90. Christmas sales, you're back to $10.89. Pay goes down and it just keeps going down despite cost of living going up. I spotted that as soon as they mentioned it in training, but knew I'd be gone by 6 months. So no big deal. That last month, I went from being one of their very best salespeople to selling a $7 belt. I rang up every single sale under my coworkers' names. I did all of the backroom work so they could focus on customers. And result? Every single one, about 6 people, made their quota and got a raise instead of a pay cut. Floor manager was a nice woman, also got a raise. When I was brought in to be fired, they had to hunt for a reason. They finally fired me for going home sick with permission from the manager an hour before I was supposed to log out. I pointed out the $7 instead of $7,000 ish I normally made in sales, collected the paycheck and walked off grinning. Already had a new job lined up and good recommendations from coworkers if I ever needed them. My coworkers all had raises and the store lost a very good salesperson as well as had to spend the next six months, the next quarter was a big sales quarter, paying everyone that higher pay rate and then the bump for the big sales quarter too. This almost surely can't be legal, can it? Either that or I'm just surprised people stick around for that. Our next story is Postcard from Auntie. I love this sub and it brought to mind a coworker who we'll just call Bill. In the late 70s, as a student, I took a job at a very upscale hotel in a resort town. I worked the desk. Bill was an older guy who was in the military and worked part time on the weekends. Bill was a friendly type, easy going on the surface, but if you ever pissed him off, we had this older couple staying there who were absolutely the worst people. They complained about everything. One day they came to the desk demanding we pay to have their rental car washed because of the seagulls crapping. Every shift it seemed they either had a complaint or a demand. They didn't tip either. When they checked out they asked for a bellman and since both were busy, Bill volunteered. They had a lot of heavy luggage but didn't tip Bill. When they left, the woman left a pile of postcards to be mailed. Bill and I, being bored, decided to read them. Then, Bill took a couple of the cards and went to the back. When he returned, he showed me his handiwork. He meticulously edited the cards by writing in one F-I-N-G to make it look like your Uncle X and I are having a thing good time. And on the other hand, to what appeared to be a postcard to some reverend, she wrote that X spent time at a local church. Well, he added, looking at boys. You could not tell that someone had messed with the cards. He had copied her style perfectly. I wonder sometimes if she had been asked about those cards. After 45 years, still makes me smile a little. Well, I guess you could say that this is some fiend good revenge. I mean, just be glad they didn't get caught. I imagine it would be hard to prove that they were the one that altered those postcards, but tampering with mail's pretty serious, right? But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another awesome revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.